All righty, friends. Good evening. Welcome back to Route 66. Everybody doing well? Yes. Hey, listen, uh, I missed you last week. Good to be back this week. No, not a, uh, well, I, I was going to say not a cloud in the sky. That's not quite true, but there is no rain, so we'll take it. So no, no storm this week. Good to be back with you all this week. This week, we are going to be in the book of Proverbs, and you know me. Uh, I always say we're in my favorite book this week, and, uh, you know, it's always like my favorite that week. Uh, but I really, really, really enjoy the book of Proverbs. It holds a special place in my heart. Uh, when I first became a, be- a believer, that was really the first book I began to really dig into. I had uh, multiple people encourage me to memorize Proverbs. So, you know, he who walks with the wise grows wise, but a companion of fool suffers harm. If you find honey, eat just enough, too much of it, and you will vomit. You know, uh, seldom set foot in your neighbor's house, too much of you, and he will hate you. Just things that I've locked in as a teenager, and, and I just, I never forgot. So special place in my heart, excited to be there this, uh, this evening. Let's pray. We'll jump in, and then I do have a quick announcement at the very, very end, but I want to honor your time. Let's jump in and give it to the Lord. Father, we do love you. Father, we give you this time. Father, be with us now. Holy Spirit, would you fill us, fill our hearts, open up hearts, minds, and ears, Lord, uh, for this Bible study this evening. We do thank you, Father, for the freedom, the ability we have to get together. Father, at the end of the day, we realize we're, we're sinners. We're not worthy, but we're worthy because of you, King Jesus. And so we love you for that. Bless this time. Be with us now. It's in Jesus' name. And all of Route 66 said? Amen. Amen. So this evening we are in the book of Proverbs. I do want to congratulate you. I didn't get a chance to tell you last time. So Psalm 118 technically is the midpoint of the Bible. Psalm 118. Being that we're in the book of Proverbs, you are over half of the Bible now. So that, that, is, that is a... Uh, I'm applauding you. Way to go. That is you. You're doing all the work towards it. Great job. You're almost there. There are 1,189 chapters in the Bible, and you have made it successfully over half of that Bible. So uh, a quick thing as we go through the book of Proverbs, the main theme, the main focus, information versus wisdom. Information versus wisdom. That is not to say knowledge over wisdom. It is information over wisdom. What do we do with wisdom? How do we apply wisdom? When is it applicable in our lives? I read this in an article which I thought to be very interesting. Prior to 2003, the world generated a total of five exabytes of content. Now listen to this. Since the beginning of human uh, recording, history that was recorded, up until 2003, there was a generated five exabytes of content. That is a total, uh, an exabyte, by the way, is one billion billion gigabytes. So today, listen to this, we generate this amount of content every two days. Let that sink in. The beginning of time till 2003, we generated five exabytes of content. Now we develop that every two days, every 48 hours, we are generating information at that speed. It's, it, it essentially doubles every couple of days. And that's overwhelming just to hear. There's always a new book. There's always a new print. There's always a new article. There's always a new study. I remember my father would quip at me or, or I would say it, when I was younger, Dad, how do you spell that? Or I'd ask him a question. His answer, L-O-O-K-I-N. And then he would spell out the dictionary to me. Look in the dictionary. Son, look it up in the encyclopedia. Well, you know, nowadays it's here. You have the encyclopedia, you have all that information in your pocket. And so as we talk about information and wisdom, we must know information doubles, but wisdom doesn't always double, unfortunately. The book of Psalms tells us the why, but the book of Proverbs tells us the how. So the book of Psalms is very, uh, very deep. It's poetry. It really is poetry in motion, as they say. It's very insightful. It's very inward focused. You're looking, you're examining, uh, and you're really examining your walk with the Lord. Proverbs puts feet to it. So if the Psalm is the, 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 the why, the Proverbs is the how, let's put it together. I heard somebody once say, Psalm tells us how to get along with God. Proverbs tells us how to walk with God. Psalm tells us how to love God privately, but the Proverbs tells us how to live out our love for the Lord publicly. For you note takers, of course, the book of Proverbs uh, famously is known for Proverbs 31, so it's not uncommon. For those that are around the Bible, they know that there's 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs. 31, Proverbs 31 is probably the most, most well-known. Probably right behind that will probably be Proverbs chapter 4, because of Proverbs 4, 7, it's mostly noted for that. But everyone mostly knows it is 31 chapters. The question for the evening, who wrote the book of Proverbs? That person is... 
Solomon, according to 1 Kings chapter 4, it tells us that Solomon wrote these Proverbs. Solomon wrote a total of 3,000 Proverbs and 1,005 songs that are mentioned in this book as well. Proverbs. If we get the word proverb, you know how we do. We do this every single week. If we're going to break down the word proverb, what does it tell us? The word proverb is a compound word. There's two words there in the Latin. Pro, P-R-O, and verb. Proverb. Proverb. Pro means for, obviously, right? We know that. If you're pro something, you're for something. Verb is going to be basically word or words. It's proverbum in the Latin. Proverbum. Verbum is in the plural. So it's pro words. Pro words. The idea is it's a short saying based on a long experience. So it's proverbum or proverbs. Everybody good so far? Now, you and I, we are not strangers to Proverbs. We have several Proverbs in English. Of course, every language and culture does. For instance, nothing traveled, nothing gained. Everyone heard that before, right? Uh, Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. I I, I like that one. I gravitate towards that one. Look before you leap. That's a proverb we were probably told ever since we're little. Uh, And also, don't make a mountain out of a molehill, which I enjoy that one too. That one's a keeper. So we're not Uh, It's not uncommon for us to be exposed to Proverbs outside of God's Word. Now, Proverbs will deal with certain words. We'll see these keywords. I like to call them keywords because they're going to be words that are going to be repeated the entire study. Words like scoffer. We're going to talk about that. Friend. Fool. Wise man. My favorite, sluggard, because it just seems so satisfying to say. Sluggard. And so we're going to be looking at those words as we study the book of Proverbs. From a 30,000-foot view... You note takers, here's the outline to Proverbs. Are we ready? Three words. Principles, Proverbs, and precepts. Principles, Proverbs, and precepts. So let's break it down. Chapters 1 through 9 talks about principles of Solomon. Chapters 1 through 9 is the first section. It talks about principles of Solomon. The common theme, it's going to say, my son, my son, my son, my son. It's going to repeat that over and over. My son. They're going to be principles from Solomon. Chapters 10 through 24 are going to cover the Proverbs of Solomon. That will really be the meat of the book, kind of the how-to. The first part is going to be kind of like wisdom. It's, like grand, it's going to be like grandpa's wisdom. Grandpa's wisdom that he's bestowing upon us. My son, my son, my son. The second section, he's going to talk about Proverbs, those, those things per, per se. Chapters 25 through 29, chapters 25 through 29, will cover the precepts of Solomon. The precepts of Solomon. Now, we get to the very last portion. That's going to be chapters 30 and 31. Here's what makes it unique. These are composed by Agor and Lemuel. Who are these guys? Is this Solomon? Is it someone different? Is it additional writers? We'll find out before we leave tonight. We'll we'll answer those questions. But those chapters 30 to 31 are Proverbs by those two gentlemen, Agar and Lemuel. So we'll take a look at that in just a couple of minutes. So let's jump in. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 1. If everyone's there this evening, say word. Good. Let's jump in with both feet. So here's what the Bible's going to say. Proverbs 1.1. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David... King of Israel. Stop right there. I just told you right there, the third king of Israel, it is Solomon. He is the author and it introduces himself right there. Verse 2, for gaining wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight. Verse 3, for receiving instruction and prudent behavior, doing what is right and just and fair. Your attention, please. Just like any book you would read, if you look at the back cover, it'll give you kind of a summary of the book. The book of Proverbs starts with its intent. It tells you exactly what it wants to, what it wants to accomplish. It's going to be for gaining wisdom and instruction, understanding words of insight, receiving instruction and prudent behavior, doing what is right, just, and fair. It'll tell you the very goal and purpose of the book. It starts right off the bat. The book of Proverbs is not shy. It tells you who the author is. It tells you the purpose, and it starts you off right there. I love that. It kind of hits the ground running. Very, very different from Psalms. Very, very different from Psalms. Not, not hating on the Psalms. I had a good friend of mine say, you know, I would rather do the Proverbs over, over the Psalms because the Psalms are just so like mushy. They're just so feely. I, I want action. And that's what you get with Proverbs. It's kind of using that, but in a practical way. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 6. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 6. Or excuse me, chapter 1, verse 4. Pardon me. Chapter 1, verse 4. Forgiving prudence... 
to those who are simple, knowledgeable and discretion to the young. Listen to this, verse 5. Let the wise listen and add to their learning and let the discerning get guidance. Your attention, please. The idea is that the individual, the learner wants to keep learning. The fool is going to say, I know it already. The fool is going to say, I've heard it, I know it, I've done it. Isn't it interesting that you can study the Word? We can continue going through Scriptures till our, the end of our lifespans or until the rapture happens. We're going to continue to go through it over and over and over, but we will always get something different out of God's Word. We never just get to the thought of saying, I know everything, because that's prideful in nature. There's always something to learn. I know an individual... Uh, his name is Marty Potters. Marty Potters is in his mid, he's like mid, mid to late 70s. Uh, he has three earned doctorates. He was a, uh, a pharmacist. He also worked for a little while as a chiropractor. And then he has another doctor, and I don't, some kind of field of um, energy or something like that. But this guy, Marty Potters, Dr. Potters, uh, is going to school this summer. He's going to go for another master's degree. And I told him, I, I call him Doc, Doc, um, Dr. Potters, school? Three year doctorates? Like all of this information. He's like, yeah, what am I going to do? Let my brain rot? I'm thinking all of this information and knowledge you have, but that's the heart of the learner. That's the heart of the learner. He said to me, uh, I don't just want to sit around. Plus, without the deadlines, I won't learn it. And that's the luxury of school. The luxury of school is that there's a deadline. The luxury of this for me, we're no different. We're all students of God's word. This is a deadline. That's a luxury. I have to do this by the deadline. And so that's what we learn from him as well. Uh, verse 6, as we finish that passage there, verse 6. For understanding Proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the, what's that word? Wise, wise. This word wise or wisdom specifically in the original language is hakam. Hakam. H-A-K-A-M. Hakam. Hakam means to be skilled at something. That's what wisdom is. It's, it's to be skilled at something. The question is not just being skilled in something, but knowing how to use it and when it's appropriate to use it. That's wisdom. It's a difference between a golf club and a baseball bat. It's the difference between a golf club and a baseball bat. You're going to have your driver, and you're going to have your baseball bat. They both accomplish essentially the same thing. They're both going to hit a ball in some fashion. Hopefully it's going forward. Hopefully you're not slicing it. But if you're a baseball player, you're not going to stand at, the, at, the, at home plate with a golf club in your hand. Unless you're a Marlin fan or, or you're a race fan, you're going to accomplish the same thing because we're not hitting for anything. But you want to do that at, at, a, at, a, at home plate. If you're at the golf course, you're not going to use a baseball bat. It's not wise. It's not the right time to use it. You could use a baseball bat, but don't use it on the golf course. You may have the best swing. You could be a Mark McGuire or Sammy Sosa, but we're not going to use that bat on a golf course. It won't be appropriate for it. That's the idea that we get. We use wisdom when appropriate. We know how to use it, and we know when to use it. If that makes sense, say yes. Charles Spurgeon once said this, which I thought to be very interesting. He brings about a great point. Charles Spurgeon said this, in the body of Christ, there are many 70-year-old infants. What's his point in that? He's saying this. Wisdom is not proportionate with age. There are wise young people. There are wise older people. There are foolish younger people. There are foolish older people. It doesn't matter. If the idea is the wisdom comes from the Lord. It comes from the Holy Spirit. And that's the idea in which um, Solomon gives us in the book of Proverbs. Now, for the rest of our time, just like Psalms, all right, I don't want to disappoint you. I don't want to go super long. I want you to come back next week, right? Next week is Ecclesiastes. That'll also be an interesting study. So I want to make sure to honor your time. It is impossible for me to go through every single proverb, but I'm going to break it down in four major themes. Is that fair? Okay, I'll give you four major themes of the book, which will thread its way through. So my, my goal is to go through these four themes that will weave itself through the book, and then we'll go home at a reasonable time, at the normal time. Promise? Okay, good, let's go. So our four major themes, write this down if you're a note taker, they're going to really be four peaks that we're going to climb, four battles. The first one is the mind, your mind, what you think, your thought pattern. The second one is motivation, motivation. Some people are more motivated than others. Uh, the Bible, the, the Proverbs is going to talk about the sluggard, slothfulness, laziness. The third one is going to be the mouth. The mouth. Your words, how you use it, how you're building up, how you're edifying, if you're tearing down. 
The last one, since it has to start with an M, is going to be mistake. Mistake. What do I mean by mistake? Overcoming mistakes. Overcoming mistakes. So our four themes are going to be the mind, motivation, mouth, and overcoming, it has to start with an M, mistakes. Okay? So far so good? So the very first battle is going to be the battle for the mind. The battle for the mind. This is going to be the fear of God versus the fear of man, ultimately. The fear of God versus the fear of man. The Bible is going to get very specific here. Proverbs will tell us really where wisdom and, wi- and knowledge comes from. It's going to say the very origin of, of where it begins. Proverbs 1.7 will answer that question. Proverbs 1.7. Whoever fears the Lord has a secure fortress. Listen to this. And for their children. It, oh, I'm sorry. I jumped to the wrong verse. Proverbs 1.7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. That's better. The fear, just making sure you're paying attention. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Your attention, please. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. That's where it starts. Where does knowledge come from? Where does wisdom start? Starts with fearing God. That's step one. If you were to follow those breadcrumbs, it'll lead, it'll start, it'll originate from fearing God in the first place. Proverbs 9.10 No need to go there. I'll read it to you. Proverbs 9.10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. There are a total of 18 references to the fear of God in the book of Proverbs. 18 total references. The theme of fearing God shows up in Scripture 50 times. So 50 times in the Bible, but there's 18 mentions in the book of Proverbs, which is quite a bit for a book of 31 chapters. That comes up quite a bit. Now, since we're talking about fear, it's important for us to talk about what fear is and what fear isn't. Fear of God does not mean that we are afraid to approach the Lord or that we're afraid of God in a personal sense. The entire purpose of the gospel is that Jesus, who is worthy, died for people who are unworthy to die in the place of our sin, to remove that sin, right? To also adopt us into his family and also bring us into relationship with the Lord. It is our access to heaven. That is the gospel in the first place. We approach the throne of grace with confidence, not on what we bring to the table, not on our accomplishment, but, but on everything that Jesus has done. So we don't want to say, I'm afraid of the Lord, therefore I can't approach him. Fear, by definition, is revere and respect. To revere and to respect. In Hebrew, it's yirat, or rather say, yirat Jehovah. Yirat Jehovah. It is the fear of God. It is the reverence of the Lord. It is that that respect to the Lord. Um, A great example of this is maybe your stove as you're making those pancakes on Saturday morning. As a young boy, as a young child, I put my hand on the stove. Guess what? I haven't done it since. I was about four. I learned that lesson the hard way, but that's the fear of the stove. Guess what? I still use the stove. I'm not afraid to use the stove, but there's kind of a a, a respect for it. I don't just kind of approach it and lean on it and put my hand on it because I know what could happen. That's the same kind of idea. So if we are fearing the Lord, if we have fear of God, what will it do? What's the benefit? Number one, it's going to keep us from evil. It's going to keep us from evil. Proverbs 16.6. Proverbs 16.6. Through love and faithfulness, sin is atoned for. Through the fear of the Lord, evil is avoided. Evil is avoided. Genesis, the book of Genesis, remember a couple weeks back, we studied about Joseph. Joseph, Potiphar's wife. Potiphar's wife telling Joseph, come sleep with me. Joseph, of course, saying no. He takes off, holds onto his cloak, and now accuses him wrongly of this. But his... his, response to this, to this, this invitation, if you will, of Potiphar's wife, his response, how can I do this wickedness and serve the Lord? And that's the heart. How can I do this and serve God? How can I do this and then do the things for the kingdom? Here's the, here's the idea. Would you say we've lost the fear of God? Yes, most definitely. We have lost the fear of God. It's interesting. It's interesting how we, we kind of do this in play. God's word opened. God's word, the truth of the word of God being proclaimed, right? God's word, not the pastor's word. God's word, God's word, God's word. Interesting. Uh, In any nation, even here, 
if the president of the United States come, you know how they do. Dun, 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 Whether you voted for this individual or not, everyone in the room stands. When this person's speaking, the president, whether you voted for them or not, everyone listens. And why? Not so much the person, it's the office. It's the respect for the office. Not so much the person, it's the office. You may respect, dislike, or like that person. It's the respect of the office. Imagine the Lord enters into the room and people sit. People sit. They don't stand. It's interesting when queens and kings and, and politicians do a proclamation, everyone listens. When God's word is proclaimed, people sleep. It's a lack of fear of God. Uh, not the, not, again, not the, not the vessel, not the pastor. Pastors, pastors are coming. They're the vessel. Not important. God's word is proclaimed. God's word is proclaimed. Truth is proclaimed. We have lost that fear of God. The only time, and I will say this, we're going to go into the book of Acts and just a little bit down the road. The time the scripture will talk about somebody falling asleep, it talks about Paul going on and on. And that brother, I'm sure, could go on and on and on and on and on. Read the book of Romans. That brother can go on and on and on and on and on. And sometimes chase rabbits and say, Paul, where are you going, pro? Pa- brother, where, where is your thought? End that plane. Like, land that plane. Where is your thought going? Scripture's going to say in the book of Acts, he's going, and on and on and on. There's an individual, listen, he falls asleep, he falls to the ground, and they pick him up dead. So the Bible talks about the one time that person fell asleep, they died. Okay? So you want to put that away, make a note, or whatever you want to do with that, but process that somewhere, right? Proverbs chapter 14, verse 26. As everybody online that's watching, you just perked up, like, I'm awake, I'm awake, I'm awake, right? Proverbs chapter 14, verse 26 is going to say this. Whoever fears the Lord has a secure fortress, and for their children... It will be a refuge. Another way to say this, the fear of the Lord will bless your life and also the next generation to come. And that is a promise of God. The fear of God is the beginning of knowledge and of wisdom. Proverbs 14, 27. Proverbs 14, 27. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life, turning a person from the snares of death. What a proclamation. Turning them away from disaster. It turns them away from destruction. It even turns them away from death. And that is wisdom in action. We see Abraham. Abraham willing to sacrifice the thing most precious to him, his son. What caused him to do that? The fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is what caused him to be obedient. The fear of the Lord caused him to be obedient, even though it will will cause him possibly substantial amounts of pain. But he's willing to be obedient. He's willing to sacrifice, and the Lord meets him in that sacrifice. Genesis 22, verse 12. Genesis 22, verse 12. He said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, For now, I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of all knowledge and wisdom. So we've talked about the battle for the mind. The next one is going to be the battle for motivation. This is a fun one. The battle for motivation. What is it that makes you tick? We're going to be talking about work, work ethic. It is the diligent person versus the lazy person. The diligent person versus the lazy person. In other words, let me summarize. Work, work. And for some, that's a dirty, nasty word. But for the believer, we worship in our labor. We worship in our work. It's not so much what we do, but it's how we do it. It's not what we do, but it's how we do it. A couple of quotes. Um, A poet and philosopher back in the 1800s, an Irish guy by the name of Oscar Wilde said this, the best way to appreciate your job is to imagine yourself without it. Another gentleman, Douglas Adams said this, I love deadlines. I like the whooshing sound they make as they fly by. Uh, Tremendous family man of the 1990s and philosopher, Homer Simpson. Son, if you really want something in this life, you have to work for it. Now quiet, they're about to announce the lottery numbers. One of my favorite ones on this too, Abraham Lincoln, President Abraham Lincoln said this, my father taught me to work, but I do not love it. I never did like to work and I don't deny it. I'd rather read, tell stories, crack jokes, talk, laugh, Anything but work. Whole lot of philosophies on work. A good, bad, a sound, blessed, dirty, horrible, despicable. But the idea is our relationship with work says a lot about us and our worship. Proverbs chapter 6, 
verse 6. I'll give you a second to get there. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 6. So far so good? All right. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 6 is going to say this. Go to the ant, and I love this word, you sluggard. Just sounds slow, doesn't it? Sluggard. Some translations, modern day way of saying this, lazy bones. Lazy bones. It's going to say, go to the ant, you lazy bones. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler. Verse 8, yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. Verse 9, how long will you lie there, you sluggard, you lazy bones? When will you get up from your sleep? Verse 10, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a thief, and scarcity like an armed man. Your attention, please. Wow. Poverty is going to come on you like a thief. And here's the reality. Here's the reality is when we look at this. Sometimes we mis misinterpret work. We'll say work is because of the, the curse of mankind. Go work. Adam and Eve were working before the fall of man in Genesis 3. They were working all along, folks. And in fact, we'll get this later on. Don't mean to spoil the movie for you. Before we end the book of Revelation in just three weeks, uh, we're going to be going into a little bit about millennial reign, kingdom, what heaven is. And in heaven, we all have jobs. We're working. You know this. That's not an internal uh, retirement home where we just kind of sit and just play harps. We're all serving and also ruling and reigning with Christ. We all have jobs. We all have responsibilities. So we're all there. The curse is not the mandate of work. The curse doesn't bring work. The curse brings sweat from the brow. It's the toil. It's the, ba the, the back giving out, your knees giving out, your body giving out. Not the work, but it's the sweat in which it produces. Um, my brother, who is a manager at Publix, and he told this story uh, to me several years ago. I never forgot it. It greatly impacted my heart and just really encouraged me. My father being a, my, my brother, excuse me, being a meat manager at Publix, hires people, right, in his department. And so it's, you know, he's going to staff and schedule his employees and does the reviews and does, you know, the manager type type of things. Uh, he, during a couple years ago, hired a young man who was a youth pastor. This guy must have been probably in his early to mid-20s. He was a youth pastor, needing some extra income. He works now at Publix in the meat department reporting to my brother. I remember this young man now quitting. I, I think at that point, he either went to another church or he became full-time at his church and he no longer needed that extra income. So God provided for him and he was leaving Publix. My brother telling me this, which I never forgot, I'm so bummed out that this kid is leaving me. Really? Why? Tell me about it. This youth pastor... He is the best worker ever. He, I mean, he is the best. He goes above and beyond. He never calls out sick. He always shows up. He's respectful. I tell him what to do and he does it and he far exceeds my expectations. And I thought to myself, yes, well done, brother. I don't know this guy. I don't know this youth pastor. I don't even know where he is today. I don't know, I don't know him. And I thought, just thought to myself, yes. What a great testimony. What a great testimony. My brother even said, I gotta hire more youth pastors. And I thought, yes. Amen. Amen. Being a Christian is a stamp of quality on your life. That's what that means. It's a stamp of quality. That means you're the best in what you do. You are excellent in what you do. In and, and any trade. Remember what we said. It's not about the job. It's about how you do it. And so that's a great reminder for anyone of, man, we do it unto the Lord. We worship through our work unto the Lord to the glory of God. Now, listen to this. A lazy person also won't finish things. They won't follow through. Proverbs 12, 27. Proverbs 12, 27. The lazy do not roast any game, but the diligent feed on the riches of the hunt. So you, you, you have gotten your kill. You got your protein ready to go. And you're just so lazy, you don't want to prepare it. The next one, even worse. Proverbs 19, 24. This is a good one. Proverbs 19, 24. A sluggard buries his hand in the dish he will not even bring it back to his mouth. So they're just so lazy. It, it's, you have your bowl of soup, and instead of bringing the soup uh, spoon to your mouth to consume the soup and now eat the soup, they're so lazy, they just put their hands on the table and say, I, I just don't want to feed myself. And that's kind of the, the, the pattern that we get here on laziness in the book of Proverbs. The lazy person also won't face things. They'll always have an excuse. They won't face something. They're always going to have an excuse as to why they don't want to do it. Proverbs twenty-two thirteen. Proverbs twenty two thirteen, The sluggard says, 
There's a lion outside. It'll kill me in the public square. There's a lion outside. I can't go out there. We're Floridians. There's, a, there's an alligator out this door. I can't go out there. There's always a reason as to, the, as to why they don't want to do it. There's always some kind of excuse. By the way, an excuse, if you're a note taker, an excuse is a skin of reason stuffed with the lie. An excuse is a skin of reason stuffed with the lie. I heard somebody once saying that's a keeper. Proverbs 20, verse 4. Proverbs 20, verse 4. Sluggards, right? There's that word again, the lazy bones. Sluggards do not plow in season. So at harvest time, they look but find nothing. They look but find nothing. Proverbs 26, 14. Proverbs 26, 14. This is a, a really common verse in the Bible, especially on this topic of laziness. Proverbs 26, 14. As the door turns on his hinges, so a sluggard turns in his bed. Anyone ever heard that proverb? So the door turns on his hinges, the sluggard turns in their bed. I heard Keith Green once, it's, it's a song that he sings, Jesus Christ rose from the dead and you, my friend, can't even get out of bed, right? And that's going to be that, that reminder there, this person who just can't motivate themselves. That, I mean, that's really the key. Whether we like to sleep or we don't like to sleep, we sleep eight hours or sleep four hours and we're still able to function, God bless you. Um, it's not really the sleep per se, not even being a night hour or morning person, it's the person who can't motivate themselves. They can't seem to get themselves going. They can't seem to get themselves started. So the next battle, everybody's still good? Everybody, we're still on the same page? The next battle is going to be the battle of the mouth. So we talked about the mind. We talked about motivation. The third one is going to be the battle for our mouths, what we say, our words. This eventually is going to be the wholesome mouth versus the polluted mouth. The wholesome mouth versus the polluted mouth. By the way, the words tongue, Lips and mouth are mentioned, get this, 150 times in this book. Would you say this is maybe a priority for the Holy Spirit to know about our tongue, our mouth, our lips, our words in the book of Proverbs? Yes. That is a big fat yes. 150 times it is mentioned in the book of Proverbs. So Proverbs chapter 6, Proverbs chapter 6 starting in verse 16. If you were to ask yourself, what is the will of God? I want to be in God's will. What pleases the Lord? In order to ask that question, in order to answer that question, you got to ask the question, what is the Lord not like? That's a great question. How do I please the Lord? What does, he not like? what does he not like? I'll even say this. I'll ask this question. What does the Lord hate? And that might not settle well with people. And they might say, wait a minute. God doesn't hate anybody. He doesn't hate anything. God doesn't hate Yes, he does. In fact, he hates six things. And it's noticed right here in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16. So it's going to tell us the six things the Lord hates. With emphasis on that word hate. Everybody with me there? Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16. Here's what the Bible's going to say. There are six things the Lord hates. Right off the bat. God doesn't hate anything. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. And it's right there. In fact, he hates six things. There are six things the Lord hates. It says this. Uh, Seven that are detestable to him, a haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. That's the list. Those are like, you want to see like, how do I please God? Don't do that. Right? How do I honor the Lord in my everyday activity? Don't do those things. So it's going to talk about the haughty eyes. That's going to be a pride, pride of the eye. Pride, you know, we do this all the time on social media, right? We take, we take pictures of experiences and food and objects to, to impress people that we don't like, right? We try to kind of fabricate this picture. We try to fabricate this idea that isn't really real. We try to pose and we do this and there's nothing wrong with it. But really at the end of the day, a lot of people do it for their likes. They do it for their follows. It's the haughty eyes. Of course, the lying tongue. If we're not telling the truth, and if it's a half a truth, it's still a lie. So it says the lying tongue. Hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that devises wicked schemes. Feet that are quick to rush into evil. And that's really interesting. I believe in no other generation like ours currently, uh, we have a culture of people's feet who are just willing. They're not, they're not rushing to evil, man. They are sprinting towards it. They are going as fast as, as humanly possible to evil. A false witness who pours out lies and a person who steers up conflict in the community. And so those are the things that the Lord does not like. In fact, he hates. Proverbs 25, verse 11. 
Proverbs 25, verse 11. Like apples of gold and settings of silver is a ruling rightly given. That's going to be Proverbs 25, 11. So our words are going to be, especially the bride of Christ, God's people, their words are going to be what edifies, what builds up. An ambassador, a teacher, a lawyer will all use your words, but all for different purposes. Uh, author Mark Twain said this in a quote. Mark Twain says this, The difference between almost right word and the right word is a really large matter. It's a difference between the lightning bug and lightning. And so uh, I, I, gotta, I gotta tell you, I'm from Florida. I've been here my entire life. I'm from South Florida, not too many lightning bugs. I didn't see those till I got married as an adult in Tennessee. And I thought, what in the world are these things? Never saw them till I went to Tennessee as an adult when I was married. Um, so you kind of see the lightning bug, bug and it's impressive. And Mark Twain's point is, man, there's a, quite a difference. The lightning bug and lightning. That's the difference between a good word, the right word, or the wrong word. And that's the power that we have. The book of James, James, Jesus' scrappy half-brother, tells us in the book of James, Man, your tongue has the power of life and death. It is, it is the main motivator and factor of all things. Proverbs 18.21, listen to this. The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. So what do words do? They're going to affect emotion. They're going to affect relationships. And they're going to affect destinies. That's what it does. It builds, you can either build up, encourage, esteem, correct sometimes when applicable. That's also, your words can also be used strategically to do that. But it's important that we don't tear down. We don't beat up. If you, if you are, are somebody, maybe uh, as an adult even, you still hear those words in your head, right? You're stupid. You're a dummy. You're, you're never going to do this. You'll never amount to anything. And being told that at any age, you never forget. Whoever said sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Boy, they got that wrong. They really did. I'd rather be hit than be told something. I'll be honest. I can heal. Wounds can heal. Bones can heal. But those words will never, ever, ever, ever go away. Um, of course, you've heard of, of Charles Stanley. Dr. Charles Stanley just went, to home, went home to be with the Lord a couple years ago. His son, Andy Stanley, pastors a church in, uh, in, in Atlanta, in North, uh, North Point there. Is he still there, by the way? I don't know. I don't even know. Okay. I'll look up. I'll fact check that some other time. But he has a son, Andy Stanley, at a local church in Atlanta. And Andy Stanley talks about the power of words. He talked about as a child, his father, Charles Stanley, told him every day on a daily basis, man of God, man of God, man of God, man of God, man of God. Even in discipline, man of God, man of God, where it was so driven into his head. His father would say, Andy, if you submit and trust the Lord, give him your plan A. The Lord will never disappoint you. Don't come up with a plan B. Don't let the enemy derail you. The Lord's plan A is better than anybody else's plan B. Trust the Lord, man of God, man of God, man of God. And obviously, Andy Stanley is used of God to, to preach the gospel in his platform. But man, those words are what stick. Those words are what stick. Proverbs 12, 18. Proverbs 12, 18. The words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise uh, brings healing. The tongues of the wise brings healing. It's almost like doing um, maybe the prayer request. You know, we don't gossip in church but we'll do it during a prayer request. Have you heard so-and-so? Have you heard so-and-so? And we start praying. And that's what that scripture is saying. Be careful with our words. Be careful. Be careful even in the prayer request. Be careful to do that. Proverbs 12, 25. Proverbs 12, 25. Anxiety weighs down the heart, but a kind word cheers it up. Anxiety weighs down the heart, but a kind word cheers it up. Somebody once said, uh, more flies are caught with honey than with vinegar, right? And uh, a couple of weeks ago, I, I watched a, a TED Talk of somebody uh, talking about an issue of something I was going to teach on. And she gives this example of edifying words and the power of your words. I found it to be humorous, uh, and, I, and I know that it's applicable. So telling her husband, hey, dear, don't forget to take out the trash. Hey, dear, don't forget to take out the trash. Honey, don't forget to take out the trash. Sir, would you please take out the trash? And you know, a husband just kind of forgets to do it. And so one day she tells, she tells her husband, I even wanted to quote it correctly, Honey, 
I love the way you take out the trash and the way that your muscles ripple as you pull out the trash. And she said this, it was kind of a social experiment. She says that to her husband and he hasn't missed a day since is what she said. And so he'll go out every day, pull out the trash, maybe sometimes without a shirt. He's gonna pull his trash, he's gonna take it out he's gonna do, and he's gonna do it. Why? Ultimately, this, this brother needs to get over and take out the trash regardless, but anxiety weighs down the heart. But a kind word cheers it up. We're gonna catch more flies with honey than we will with vinegar. Proverbs 16, 28. Proverbs 16, 28. A perverse person stirs up conflict and to gossip separates close friends. That's another great verse on that. As we land the plane on that, that'll be Proverbs 16, 24, which will be the last one on the mouth. Proverbs 16, 24. Gracious words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. Your attention, please. Um, and even just working with teenagers, knowing the power of affirmation, knowing the power of speaking in, building up and edifying. And that should be the words of the believers, amongst the believers. We should encourage one another. Different from flattery, the book of Proverbs also will talk about that. There's a difference between flattery and encouragement. And so the Bible does state that in the book of Proverbs. But it's important that we encourage one another to use those words to edify and to build up. Um, my senior year in high school, I had a mentor uh, of mine by the name of Steve Ross. Steve Ross was a missionary to Peru. He was also a pilot who would often fly to the Bahamas bringing not only the gospel, but also relief things and toiletries and clothing and food. And uh, he was also the chaplain at the school I was attending. At that time, I was uh, 17, 18 years old, feeling a call to ministry and just being deathly afraid to stand in front of people. And uh, Steve Ross, who I called Mr. Ross, and uh, he told me one day, hey, Roger, you're going to be speaking at chapel this week. And I just looked at him funny like, no, I'm doing what? Uh, I'd rather take out the trash. I'll do anything. I'm not going up there to speak in front of people. I said, oh, you will. Uh, God's going to use you that way. I believe that with all my heart. Mr. Ross, I think you misheard. I don't think so, sir. I doubt it. Uh, can you get back with the Lord? Let me know. Is that Roger, trust me. God's going to use you this way if you are obedient and you're available. If you don't derail yourself in the mission, be faithful. You'll see what the Lord will do. And sure enough, I, I started to get those opportunities and it's my day to speak. I'm at the front row. My, my knees are shaking. My mouth is super dry. I go to the, I go to the water fountain. And I just try to, try to swig as much water to keep my mouth from drying up because I just had cotton mouth the entire time. I go up. I'm a nervous wreck. I'm sweating profusely. But man, I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful for Steve Ross. I'm so grateful for his encouraging, edifying word. At 17 years old as a high schooler, you know, in high school, there's nothing bigger than high school. That's your entire life. As adults, you're looking and say, it's no big deal, kid. Just get up there, right? Um, as a 17-year-old, that's it. The, the acceptance of my peers, there was nothing bigger, nothing more important to me. So to, for me to go up with the encouragement of somebody that got me going, I'm grateful. I'm grateful. Use those words to upbuild. Use those words to edify. Uh, so the very last portion, now we're going to talk about the battle of overcoming our mistakes. So we talked about the mind, the motivation, the mouth. The very last theme is the battle of overcoming mistakes. We make a mistake and we have to learn how to overcome them. And Proverbs will touch on that quite a bit. So it's going to be isolation versus fellowship. Isolation versus fellowship. What do people do when they're ashamed? They avoid. What do people do when they, when they make mistakes? They run away. They, they don't confront the Lord. They don't go to the Lord. They run away from the Lord. Instead of going and leading into the body, they run away from the body. Instead of going to church, they avoid church. And so we're going to be looking at that tonight as we close this plan on this final portion, the final, the final theme. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 1. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 1. It's going to say this. An unfriendly person pursues selfish ends and against all sound judgment starts quarrels. So with that being said, there are many people who close themselves off because they've been hurt. There are many people who don't have any kind of relationship, don't have any close friendships because they've been hurt in the past. They close, they close themselves off and they tell people, don't come near me. I don't want anyone near me. They don't ever become vulnerable with anybody. They don't make themselves available because they're afraid of being hurt. With that being said, there's plenty of folks with church hurt. And sadly, that happens quite a bit. There's church hurt. People were hurt by somebody at church. And can I tell you, the church is a mess. It's, it's, a, it's full of messy, dysfunctional sinners who need Jesus day by day. They need his grace daily. Stick around for more than five minutes. Someone's going to hurt your feelings. We're broken people. 
The pastor will disappoint you. Somebody will disappoint you. But here's the reality. When church hurt happens, after a period of time, we re-engage. Has anyone ever, here ever had food poisoning? Yeah, I'm sure. Part of life. Food, ever had some kind of food poisoning? Yes. It's awful. What happens when your food poisoning goes away? You eat again. Yes. You don't avoid food. It's not like, man, I'm just afraid to go for food. I'm just going to starve. No. We heal, we recoup, and we move forward. Now it needs the body of Christ, mature believers, to say, welcome. Not people who are going to say, where have you been? We need people to say, how you been? Welcome. Welcome home to embrace them, to welcome back into the body. That's what the church needs. And so that's going to be kind of what we're talking about. The Bible also talk about the value of a friend. The value of a friend. Overcoming obstacle, overcoming mistake with the help of your friends. Proverbs 17, 17. Proverbs 17, 17 is going to say this. A friend loves at all times. And a brother is born for a time of adversity. So the old adage, the old saying, of course, uh, w when things get really difficult, when things get very hard, you go through a really hard circumstance, you know, you know who your friends are. You know who's going to stick by you. You know who's going to be available to you. You know who's going to check in on you. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for a time of adversity. We are grateful for those very close friends. Proverbs 18.24. Proverbs 18.24. One who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin. But there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Your attention, please. Friendship obviously takes time. It's earning trust with somebody and you're earning more trust and you open yourself up. You become more, more vulnerable. That's, excuse me, that's friendship. It just takes place over time. But ultimately, it's that heart of Naomi and Ruth. It's Ruth telling her mother-in-law, Naomi, you know, Naomi saying, dear Go on with your life. You're young. You're beautiful. Go. Remarry. Have a family. And Ruth just saying to her mother-in-law, where am I going to go? <laughs> where am I going to go? I'm following you. Where you go, I will go. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. That's a friend. That's someone who sticks close to you no matter what. And the Bible talks about those people being an incredible, incredible blessing. Proverbs 27, 17. Proverbs 27, 17. I'm sure you've heard this verse somewhere along your path or somewhere along your journey. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. By show of hands, have you heard that verse? Very common in the Bible, very well known. The idea is that one person is sharpening the other person. It's almost like dual swords are sharpening the blades. After all, a sword is used with great intention. Right? It's almost like a steak knife. No, a steak knife used with great intention. It's not a dart. A dart really isn't used for intention. You're trying to hopefully hit the bullseye. You may or may not land on that bullseye, but the sword is used intentionally. So we are to sharpen one another. A great book on this, folks. Hopefully you're our reader because we're all learners here, right? Amen? We're all learners according to the book of Proverbs. We desire that learning. Um, Henry Cloud, Dr. Henry Cloud, wrote an incredible book on this called Safe People. I think I may have... Um, uh, recommended that book from this pulpit probably 10 or 15 times. Safe People by Dr. Henry Cloud. Highly, highly recommend. Anything that Dr. Cloud writes, I'd highly recommend. But Safe People is a great book. It talks about who's safe, who's unsafe. How do you know if that's a safe person? Also, more importantly, how do you know if you're safe? How do you know if you're a safe person? And I love books like that. We don't just like point at other people. You start looking at it and say, ouch, yeah, that's me. I need to correct that. So it's a great read. Safe People by Dr. Henry Cloud. Ultimately, this iron sharpen, sharpening iron, being friends with one another. We can't use extroversion and introversion as an excuse. We need to be ourselves. We need to honor the Lord. And we need to make ourselves available. Studies show this. MBTI, those are the folks that do the Myers-Briggs, right? The DISC profile, if you're familiar with that stuff. I love that kind of stuff. Uh, MBTI made a study back in 2023. Last month, or excuse me, last month. A couple months ago, last year, 2023. Their study showed that, the, that currently our country consists of 56.8 introverts. 56.8 introverts. You know what that means? Over half of the population are introverted. Over half the population. So we can't use this as an excuse. We can't say, well, I'm introverted. I can't do that. Or I'm extroverted. I can't do that. L listen, we are to make ourselves vulnerable. We are to ha have these moments of iron, iron, iron sharpening iron and also be in the church to uplift and encourage one another. A, a lady by the name of Dinah Maria Molik Kralik says this in a book. Listen to this. Oh, the comfort 
the inexpressible comfort of feeling safe with a person, having neither to weigh thoughts nor measure words, but to pour them all out just as they are, chaff and grain together, knowing that a faithful hand will take and sift them, keep what is worth keeping, and then with the breath of kindness, blow the rest away. Hey, listen, you ever had a friend like that? A friend that you're able to vent to, they're not going to hold you on it. They're not going to judge you. They're not going to say, I can't believe you said that. But a friend that's going to let you vent. Oh, we call this the, the lightning rod. That's when I need to vent. Just give me a couple minutes, right? Lightning rod, here it is. You need friends like that. We need people that are, that are not going to hold us against, not, not hold this against us. I can't believe you said that. Let me correct you, but no, let me, how's your heart? Let me know how you're feeling. That's the kind of friends that we need. Now, we're down now to the very nitty gritty. This is going to be Proverbs chapter 31. So we're going to be closing, looking at Proverbs chapter 31. Proverbs 31, of course, is the most well-known chapter in the entire book. Um, not to be funny, not to be humorous. You go into a Christian bookstore, you're going to find stuff on Proverbs 31. Near Mother's Day, you're going to find things on Proverbs 31. It's very well known in that book. But you'll notice something very interesting. As you get to Proverbs chapter 31 in your Bible, do that now. Join me. Proverbs 31. Remember last week we were talking about the headers and Psalms? Pay attention to this one. You'll see this. It's going to say in front of Psalms 31, sayings of King Lemuel. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Your attention, please. I thought you said Solomon wrote this. Who's this guy? Who, who on earth is this guy? By the way, you note takers, Lemuel means belonging to God. Belonging to God. Your attention, please. So the Bible doesn't say anything about this King Lemuel. Who is this guy? Where is he from? If he's a king, what did he rule? He had to have ruled something. Otherwise, he's not a king. He has to rule a kingdom. Who is this guy? Here's what we see. No mention of this guy in scripture. No mention of this guy through history. So a lot of Bible scholars hang their hat and they agree on this. Supposedly, what, they're, what they believe, not supposedly, I said, it, it is commonly accepted that King Solomon was named Shlomil, right? That's Samuel. Shl or excuse me, Shlomo. Shlomo is, Sam is Solomon in Hebrew. Shlomo, right? Solomon. But perhaps he was also known by another name. It is believed that his mama, Bathsheba, named him this, Lemuel. That's the name that he kind of refers to her as. So he kind of puts his own nickname there. Anyone ever, uh, here have a nickname? Maybe a childhood nickname, a school grade uh, school nickname, uh, maybe a nickname now that your family calls you or friends call you. The point is, is that the sayings of King Lemuel, that is also Solomon. Interesting. Interesting. So it is very commonly accepted to say that's another name. That's another name for Solomon. If that makes sense, say yes. Okay. So Proverbs chapter 31 and verse 10. Uh, Proverbs 31 verse 10. It's going to say this. A wife of noble character, who can find? She is worth more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. Uh, jumping to verse 28. Verse 28. It's going to talk about their children. Her children arise and call her blessed. Blessed. Blessed is also, uh, we said on Sunday, a stained glass word. Sometimes we use this word so many times, we kind of forget what it means because of tradition. We say it over and over and over. Another way, another translation for blessed is happy. 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 Her children arise and call her happy, call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Verse 29, many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. What a statement. What a statement about his bride. All, all, all the fish in the sea, of all these women on planet earth, you're the one. You're the one. Of all the fish in the sea, to quote a, uh, a very famous, well-known philosopher of the day, uh, Phoebe Buffay, of all the fish in the sea, you're my lobster. You're my lobster. And I, I just love that beautiful, beautiful way to write that. Last, finally, Proverbs chapter 31, verse 30. Proverbs 31, verse 30. Okay, as we close the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 31, verse 30. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting. Listen to this. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. And I will even add this if I could, if, it, if it's even appropriate here, which I think it is. In other words, most beautiful person, 
most handsome person, what counts is on the inside. It's the person on the inside. That, that's what that's saying. The, 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 the handsomeness, the hair, the locks, the smile, that fades. Even the things we find attractive in our spouse. After a while, you're like, enough, right? Stop. And so that's what it's talking about. It's the inside. It's the inside of that person. Verse 31, finally, as we close the book. Honor her for all that her hands have done. And let her works bring praise at the city gate. So Proverbs 31, again, very, very commonly known. The most well-known probably chapter in all of the book. Probably right behind that would probably be Proverbs chapter 4. So here's our closing. Here's our conclusion. Solomon. We talked about him a couple of weeks back as we studied uh, those books of, of 1 Kings and 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, um, and also the books of First and Second Chronicles, you recall. So we've heard Solomon kind of bit, uh, quite a bit. Shlomo, Shlomo. We've heard him a lot, right? Would you agree, King Solomon? Solomon, unfortunately, tragically, is known for wisdom, but he's a guy that did not finish well. That old saying, it's not how you start, it's how you finish. Started off really well, but burned out at the end. Here's a lesson tonight for the book of Proverbs. Let us not burn out. Let us finish well. Let us run the race well, as Paul would say. Let us finish the race well. James chapter 1, verse 22. This is what I like to call a, a bonus verse, right? James chapter 1, verse 22. I'll read it to you. James James chapter 1, verse 22. But be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Listen to this, verse 23. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is a man observing his natural face in the mirror. And I like that word natural. That's like the first time you look at yourself, you wake up, you look in the mirror and say, oh dear, right? And then you go fix everything you got to fix. You got to go pluck, pull, um, squeeze, stab. You got to brush, right? You got to do all these things uh, in order to make ourselves presentable. And it's saying this, for anyone who's a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in the mirror. Verse 24, but he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. That is to say, this person wakes up in the mirror, they look at themselves in the morning, they say, wow, time to do fill in the blank. Time to do this, right? Hopefully brush your teeth is part of that, right? Time to do this. Good morning. Wow. That person looks at themselves intently in the mirror. They walk away and they forget what they look like. That's what the Bible says. That's someone who only is going to hear the word, but never do it. They're going to listen and listen and listen. Get wisdom, or excuse me, get knowledge and information and thing and thing and thing, but never do anything with it. What a tragedy. What a waste. What a loss. May we finish well. May we be doers of the word and not just hearers. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Let's give it back to the Lord. Father, we do thank you for this evening. We thank you for this incredible study of the book of Proverbs. Lord, we thank you for this book. It is dynamic. All 31 chapters. I'm so grateful for this book, Father. I have grown leaps and bounds by studying it, by memorizing these, these Proverbs throughout the years. Father, I pray, be with those that are leaving today. Bless each one. Be with each one until we return. In Jesus' name, and everyone here said, amen. amen. Quick announcement, as I said, I would close with. Um, so we have a business meeting coming up um, next Wednesday. Next Wednesday. So uh, after this study, we're going to meet here very quickly, about five minutes, about five to ten minutes, very quickly to keep you informed on something. We also need to do something. Uh, we're working on working on the bank. You'll get more information. It gets closer. See me afterwards if you have more questions. Our relationship with the bank of some things we're trying to do. So we're trying to get notes, return it to the bank, and also keep you in the, in the loop of some of those things that we're doing. So next Wednesday, after a time, if you're a church member, I'd love for you to join us here, and we'll include you. It should be about five to ten minutes. Is that right? Five to ten minutes, okay? Any questions, come see us. But again, next Wednesday, we'll remind you again on Sunday, just very briefly, and the next Wednesday we'll do that at the end of our time together. Amen, amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord shine his face upon you, be gracious to you, and give you peace this week. Again, in Jesus' name, and all of Route 66 said, amen. amen. God bless you. You are dismissed.